Thank you very much for joining us this evening for this panel. It's it's very nice to see so many familiar, friendly faces in the crowd this evening. Uh, what I'd like to go ahead and do is just kind of open this thing up with a little bit of a thank you to the, the committee and the folks that made this uh, event today possible. So, uh, so thank you. And I uh, want to go ahead and thank the audience for taking time out of your busy evening to spend it with us. So. Let's go ahead and let's introduce our panelists. We'll start here at the far end. If you would, just go ahead and uh, let everybody know your name and kind of what you're most interested in. Great. My name is, my, my name is Jeff Pietmeyer. Um, I'm a part of the FujiNet team. And uh, my, my interests on there um, are the physical layer, making, making the FujiNet talk to new machines mostly. So. I am Tony Cooker. Um, I've been working on the PySCSI project and a couple other little things on the side. I'm Ian Scott, and I'm a retro journalist, but my heart belongs to the DOS PC from the mid 90s, and especially sound cards. So I uh, created the PicoGus project to bring back to life a lot of sound cards. My name's uh, Eric Helgeson, and I am the maintainer of Blue SCSI. It's a SCSI emulator for all your vintage SCSI machines, and I'm most focused on uh, firm firmware and feature development. Hey, everybody. Joe Stroh Snyder of Joe's Computer Museum. Thanks, Garth. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I am also a Blue SCSI uh, reseller, but uh, my primary focus is the Apple II and Macintosh. Apple II forever. Absolutely. And uh, I'm Ron McAdams uh, from Ron's Computer Videos, and I am your moderator, conversation guide this evening, whatever you'd like to call me. And um, just don't call me late for dinner. The, uh, the topic of tonight's discussion panel is basically modern solution for vintage problems. Uh, I just remember getting started with this hobby again and very quickly realizing that there's a lot of things that have to all line up for you to be successful. And part of that is being able to access software, which there's a lot of great resources online now that weren't there even 10 years ago. Uh, and there's uh, even better and newer and faster ways to get that software onto your retro, retro machine. So I wanna thank everybody on this panel because you've really made my life um, not only easier, but in many cases, much more economical, <laughs> instead of trying to chase down some of these old solutions. Kind of the, the biggest thing that's on my mind is what inspired you to uh, sort of get going in the, in the uh, al along the lines of recreating some of these old products that no longer exist, or uh, creating products that kind of fill uh, different uh, sort of gaps in our hobby. So, Tony, why don't you start? Oh, sure. Um, so yeah, it kind of started um, just, you know, when COVID started, I was looking for some stuff to work on and, and uh, needed a SCSI drive for uh, my Macintosh. Um, I was looking through some forums. Um, there was this thing called Rascuzzi that used a Raspberry Pi um, and basically just some transceivers and bit banged out the, the SCSI bus. Um, and there was a guy in Japan named Gibbon, Gimmons, and I have to give him credit for, for the project, uh, for starting it. Um, but it was all in Japanese and not very accessible um, sure. to English speaking folks. Um, so with this permission, I took uh, the code and the hardware design and kind of ported it and made it more uh, Mac centric um, for my own personal use. and. Um, talked on the forums and there were a few other people interested in, in getting involved and getting their own and using it. Um, so it was, it was a fun project to um, take a, a good design and just build upon it and make it more accessible for other people. Absolutely. I know that um, Ian, uh, a lot of your device, or, or you're your, kind of the thing you're most famous for now, um, has been one of those things that sort of adds to that user experience where I just remember uh, having some of those devices that PicoGus um, emulates, or simulates rather, uh, back in the day, and just the difficulty of uh, kind of getting those things configured. Um, why don't you maybe tell people just a little bit about 
kind of the, the, the journey of bringing that all together. Yeah. Um, it basically started on Twitch, watching real retro, um, hard, real hardware streamers. And a lot of them said, like, I'd love to have a Gravis ultrasound, but they're like 300 or $400 on eBay. There's no way I'm going to ever buy one for myself. Um, and somehow I just got the idea in my head. It's like, okay, like there are emulators for the Gus, like in DOSBox, that's open source code. It, what if I got it to run on, on a Raspberry Pi or eventually a Raspberry Pi Pico? And it kind of snowballed from there. And uh, it's interesting you mentioned, you know, making it easier. Like it's a lot easier to get like a Pico Gus working than it was to get like a regular Gus back in the day. Absolutely. It, yeah. That was kind of an accident. Like I didn't set out to make it that way. It just like happened. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, I, it's something that I kind of said in my introduction was talking about how it is often difficult to kind of get software for your retro device and, and get that software downloaded. And I know, Jeff, your project very much kind of bridges the gap on that. Why don't you tell people a little bit about it? Sure. So um, I guess first, if you're a FujiNet team member in the audience, can you raise your hand? Yeah, thanks, gang. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, uh, I joined a great team. And Tom Cherry Holmes and, and uh, Moswell in the back there um, started this. Um, and for me, it really came together, just mashing together SIO to Arduino code with the, with the, uh, the Y modem code that Paul Rickards had put out, you know, that his version of it, and put those together. And, and uh, this was similar to what, what Tom and Moswell are doing, and Tom invited me over. And uh, it became a, a network adapter and a multi-peripheral device emulator. And uh, so yeah, so like that's sort of the first killer app was being able to boot the machine off the cloud, right? Off the TNF server. And I know people people love that. And then then I, I took a deep dive into printers and designing <laughs> fonts and got a, a little crazy about it. I think like did every Atari printer that existed. So that's pretty great. <laughs> it was, I, I think it's also very important to um, kind of mention about the community that has kind of risen up around uh, around your product because it's uh, it's it's kind of nice for because a lot of people talk about BBSs and things like that and so it's it's really great to be able to reconnect with some of those things but also just like the chat function or just being able to play a tic tac toe with somebody or something kind of BBS door games and and things like that. Yeah, we 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 have a. Um a developer who's done five card stud and a, 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 like a Parcheesi game, yeah. you know, turn by turn by turn based games, and we expanded um, beyond the Atari to Apple II and the Atom and Coco, and we've got Mac sixty eight thousand in development. And so we try to hit you know every vintage platform we can uh, no, to try to build a community. It's greatly appreciated, like how wide that net has been cast to try to bring in as many people and, and kind of get it out to as many communities as possible. But once you get that uh, software down to your machine, um, you often need a, a way to store that um, kind of in an economical way in, a, in an era of uh, rapidly failing mechanical hard drives. Eric, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Blue SCSI project? Yeah, the Blue SCSI project kind of started around the same time as, uh, or a little after Tony uh, started the Pi SCSI project. And Big shout out to Tony for helping me kind of learn a lot of the like KiCad and how to develop and build things like that and kind of the, you know how SCSI worked. But yeah, it started really because uh, you know all the SCSI solutions uh, out there were you know so expensive or so unuser friendly that um, you know it was just hard to use and people there's so many things that could be done that uh, people are just struggling to do. So I. Uh, Again, very similar. <laughs> There's a Japanese project card called Art, Art Scazino, which is hard to pronounce. But uh, uh, I took that code, kind of ported it over to uh, work with uh, Mac, because I'm a Mac guy as well. And uh, with a lot of help from a lot of people in the community, uh, kind of built the first version of Blue Scuzzy. I ordered uh, 25 boards, and I thought I was going to be stuck with 20 boards. Um, <laughs> but I was really wrong about that. And uh, yeah, it's just been a learning experience because I, I'm a software developer by trade and uh, I've never done embedded programming or hardware development. So, you know, I really want to thank everyone who's 
kind of helped me along this journey. And you know, all the users now have easy to use SCSI solutions that yeah. are quite affordable. It's awful nice. So, and it's really great when everything comes together and you can kind of work on something and you got a machine that just fundamentally you can just even power it on and use it. But what about those weird older machines? And I, Joe, you've got a lot of experience with this, with weird platforms that maybe didn't succeed in the marketplace, but definitely needed a little bit of love, uh, maybe some uh, quality of life, hardware improvements, things like that. Do you want to maybe speak to that? Oh, you know it, Ron. <laughs> So let me regale you of a story, a story of an old computer called the Apple III. We all know the Apple III, right? Mm -hmm. We probably kind of universally, mm, the Apple III. We've seen the t-shirt, what even can an Apple III do? So I acquired this Apple III from one of the wonderful people in the community. And it, uh, like many, many Apple III's, was stored outdoors-ish and <laughs> rodents had made a home inside of it. And I was able to get the board working, but the one thing in that Apple III that is only in that Apple III is the keyboard controller. It's the same keyboard controller that's in the Apple II, but it's a little bit different. And the only way that you can get that keyboard controller is by stealing it from another working Apple III. And I was like, by gosh, I'm not gonna kill one Apple III to make mine work. So I got the data sheets, and I learned KiCad, and I reverse engineered the keyboard controller. And I put that out there, and then uh, after putting that out there and doing a lot of other little Apple III stuff, wonderful people like Mr. Helgeson here noticed me, and he's like, Joe, can you help us distribute these other things? And it's just kind of snowballed from there to the point to where, because I want these things out there in the community, and I want people's computers to work, we have folks like Ron, He's like, hey, Joe, can you help me distribute my things? So it's kind of just grown from one Apple III not working and me not having that crap to being able to, you know, have stuff out there for everybody. So. Yeah, management has actually said that we can, we have to stop using the word snowball in Chicago. <laughs> um, that's, that's kind of like, you know, making wishes that we don't want to come true. Uh, but what Joe's saying is actually very, very important. It's, it's about identifying community need and then coming up with a solution that is economical and easy and something that is uh, able to continually be sourced. Um, if anybody else wants to kind of comment in on that, I'd really like to hear about kind of what brought you along on that journey about kind of that identifying community needs and then kind of filling that. Yeah, I think I'll go first. Uh, it's, I think the community need was, or I think when you're developing, I think most of our stuff is, you know, open source or, you know, open source adjacent. And it's, you, when you're building on that stuff, it needs to be something that is serving your needs, you know, because, you know, we're not, we, we're not paid developers. We're not getting a, a salary for this. And I think all this is kind of our, you know, so stuff we do on the side and uh, have a lot of fun doing it. So solving our problems. But then the next step after that is uh, when community members start to use it, they come to us with their problems and we're like, oh yeah, we could solve it that way. And kind of interacting, going back and forth and uh, just kind of keep expanding that uh, user base and uh, expanding how, how these solutions work. Um, for me, it was actually like part of being open source was actually getting contributions from the community that I wasn't even expecting. Um, like the mouse support that's on PicoGus was just like a pull request just came in on GitHub. It's like, boom, mouse support, yeah. thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and likewise, like Wi-Fi came from uh, Kevin Moonlight who's worked on a P PCMCAA card that's based on the Pico. Um, it's like, I couldn't have done it without all the community help, like just talking to people and just open source in general because I built off of so many existing projects. Yeah, I think for me, the, the passion from the community is what really drives me. I mean, you know, if I was just sitting there working on something for myself, um, it's fun, but then, you know, you get stuck and kind of put it to the side. But when you've got uh, someone on a Discord channel or on a forum uh, pushing you and, you know, they're excited for the, the feature or whatever you're working on, um, that's, that's huge. It's a great motivation. So for all your open source projects that you're using, let the developers and maintainers know um, that you appreciate it. So. Absolutely. 
Yeah, the, the community response really drove us. I mean, the, the response from the Atari community, uh, um, I think there was this real hunger for just being able to access software really easily. And, and makers came along, and we think there are thousands of Atari Fujinets out, out there in the wild, um, as, far as, as far as we can tell. And then the whole idea of being open source, and we have our Discord, we, we waded into the Apple II community, and, and we aren't really Apple II guys, but the reception was incredible with, I think Javier's probably maybe in the audience there, um, Rob Justice, who, who did the SmartPort SD, um, all, Oliver came along and tolerated us and, uh, and, you know, on the Discord and they started contributing and really made that Apple II, you know, took, took it to something that's actually, you know, usable and in production, so. Absolutely. I, 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 I kind of preface that with, you know, identifying community need and, and making things that are trying to help out your friends. And I, I love the collaborative nature of like Discord and the Internet and kind of these events open up just that makes it easier to kind of connect with like minded people and and talk to users directly and just say hey, get feedback on things for feature updates and all that. But my story is completely different. It's um, it's 100 percent selfish. Um, there was a lot of things that I wanted to see and I wanted them to exist and they didn't exist or they didn't exist anymore or they're at the bottom of a landfill somewhere. So things that I've made over the years have been things that are either that came directly out of frustration um, like battery, remote battery kits, things like that. Um, you can only buy so many machines that are battery bombed before you're just like, you know what, I'm just gonna, you know, I'll find the one that works and I'll make something that um, in 20 years, uh, hopefully, uh, if, the, if there's still an interest in this thing, it'll still be around because it won't be dead. So, uh, or other little things that I've worked on. Um, but it's very gratifying when people come back to you that you find the right people, you find your right audience, uh, people that are also like, you know what, I didn't know that I necessarily needed this thing until I saw it, but it's really cool. And so getting that feedback from people, I think is really important and getting uh, other people excited about the things that you're excited about um, is very, very gratifying. So how do you guys feel about the community response that your devices have kind of elicited? So. Well, I think the community response has been outstanding. The fact that we can sit in our homes, or in my case, in my basement, and tinker around with the old computers that I loved to play with when I was a kid, come up with a solution to help people, and then have those people come back and say, dude, this thing is awesome. You saved my old computer. That right there is Joe, the Joe, that whole. thing is awesome, and it saved my old computer. That's it great. did. It's true. That's great. But yeah, and to be able to do that and be, and be like to have more than just a selfish purpose, but to have a community-oriented purpose. I helped somebody today. That's, that's been very gratifying. Absolutely. Yeah, it's always fun when someone like says, oh, I pulled out my old Mac that uh, my dad had and uh, you know, I played Oregon Trail, got, got put a blue sky on it, used an image, got Oregon Trail up, showed my kids. You know, that's just like, just seeing people use it is, uh, and their stories about how, they, how they're sharing um, their vintage computers and how I, something I built helped them do that is just, uh, you know, just, really awesome. And I just wanted to reiterate, you know, like our um, pull requests too, or like new features, like the, the developer community around these things just uh, is awesome and people contributing things like Josh over there contributing the Wi-Fi code for Blue SCSI. So now everyone can, you know, connect to BBSs like it's uh, 1992 on their Mac Plus or whatever they want to do. So, yeah. Yeah, it, even just today, like so many people walked up to me and thanked me for for making the project and it just, it's so gratifying, um, which is pretty amazing. So yeah, echoing what you know everyone said, but it, it can get mixed. Some people, you know, they, they, you know, people on the internet have opinions. <laughs> so some people said, well, why didn't you use an FPGA? Or why didn't you do it this way? Or why didn't you add this impossible feature? And it's, it, sometimes you just have to tune that out and focus on what's good, but some people sometimes people have good suggestions, so I'll, I'll, I'll take them into account. I mean, why can't you make a special firmware that has a hanging note bug or something like that? I mean, that's what everybody loves. That's part of the experience, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, 
I, I added I added some um, random bit errors to the cassette emulator. Just 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 so you could have the experience of needing to reload your cassette. So what's maybe part of what's maybe one of the harder parts of um, making these modern solutions for these vintage problems? Is it um, is it really just, is it documentation and trying to figure out how the original designs worked, especially if you're cloning a product? Or is it um, basically like, how do I implement this in such a way that uh, it's not going to anger a specific community? That, you know, I've got my, uh, my stack of retirement profile hard drives or something like that. <laughs> um, what do you really think is maybe the toughest part about kind of getting those projects off the ground? Um, for me, I mean, I think you kind of hit on it. The, the, the critics are, can be very, very loud um, and persistent. So I, I think um, for me, like the, the, the technical aspects of trying to reverse engineer something is the challenge, is the fun. Um, because that first, you know, the more time you spend trying to get something to work, the first time it works, that's just the most rewarding thing for me. Mm -hmm. um, so the technical aspects are the fun, but the community aspects or, you know, I've had where people will go on rants about how the, the project is crap and it's because they, they can't, you know, they solder it incorrectly, or, you know, something like that. It's, um, those are for me the tough parts of, yeah. of supporting it. Yeah. I think 100% um, development in, in the open Mm -hmm. comes comes with problems, but it's something that we that we're really passionate about because we we don't want to we don't want to be gatekeepers, but we also just don't want to hide what we're doing because sure. you know we, we we want it to be out there, we want it to outlive us, um, and but you know that, that 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 comes from with some problems. Um, we don't we don't make our own devices. Rely on we we rely on the community makers to do that, and when you have somebody who just grabs it and doesn't tell you. And then you make the hardware change the next day after they sent all their circuit boards out for fab. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know that's that, that's kind of difficult. And and the software on the vintage machines is difficult because yeah, you're right. Like the the challenge and the really fun part, especially for me, is figuring out how these all these old interfaces work and what the signals do and all the timing and getting the logic analyzer out and doing all of that. Um, but then turn it around and to make it really useful on the machine, especially like you mentioned, the, like these multiplayer games. Well, someone has to write those multiplayer games because yeah. the vintage computers don't have multiplayer games. And, and we, got, we have Eric um, on our team doing that, and, uh, but having people come in. Or an, another really, like, so go back to your like, community question. It's really fun when somebody comes along and says, when are you going to have a FujiNet for XYZ machine? Right. I'm and still waiting for my TI-85 graphing calculator, yeah, there but there you go, right? It's, yeah. yeah, I heard it's coming. That's right. And what kind of operating system does that have, right? <laughs> well, it'll run Doom, so. <laughs> yeah, so that's a challenge. Yeah, yeah I, I had a lot of technical challenges. Um, like the ISA bus, despite the fact the middle word is standard, it really isn't a standard. It was just an agreed upon thing to follow what IBM was doing. Um, but like I could, I never ever found like a DMA timing diagram that actually told the truth. It was all an it was an idealized fiction, and it wasn't until I put a logic analyzer on it, it was like, oh, that's what's actually happening. And it that happens also like on the IBM 5150. It's like the the timing diagram and it's, it's it's wrong. It's like the data actually isn't available until like 20 nanoseconds later, but they don't tell you. <laughs> It's just, it, but I think, uh, Tony, you, you said it, it's, that's fun. It's fun getting past those uh, kind of hurdles. Yeah, I think uh, kind of building on all that is that, uh, you know, I kind of mentioned that I had never done any, like, electrical engineering or uh, embedded software development before this project. So um, sometimes in the community there are people who are, well, I've been doing EE for 40 years, and you should have done it this way. It's like, well... I have no idea. I didn't. I haven't been doing EE for. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's hardware development. I feel the, the old guard in hardware development aren't as forthcoming with like helpful information. I've done a lot of open source uh, 
other software uh, in, on the software side. And usually people are like, oh, you know, like you could do it this way, or you could do it that way. Um, so that's been a struggle for me. It's uh, you know, I, I'm learning. We're all learning. So it's uh, you know a process. And I, I think if you look back at Blue Scuzzy V1 that got running, you know, barely on a long or however many years ago it was, and now you can see the huge transition, huge learning, and huge involvement from the community. So. One of the biggest challenges, is it working? One of the biggest challenge, challenges that I've found, um, especially with cloning, is that a lot of these old machines use chips that don't exist anymore. So if you're trying to do a one-to-one -one clone, it's like, oh, this is a 256-bit by one-bit PROM. And so you're throwing in a 256 kilobyte ROM chip in there with like hackadoodle to address lines to make it work. Or this counter is some weird funky 4-bit counter. So you're like putting in some weird 16-bit counter with truncated and just all this weird stuff to make, machine, to make this stuff work. But then when you do that, timings change and the whole logic setup changes and you're having to test it and build it and test it and build it and go through, you know, I don't know, 400 copies of a, of a clone until you get it right. But, but once you work through all those challenges, it's like, hey, hey, did you know it works now? Yeah. So. You guys have talked about uh, quite a bit of people in the community, especially kind of graybeard people that will come at you and be like, I, I just remember there's kind of a, a, one of those work safety shorts where it shows a guy sitting there welding something or, or using like a torch or something on a, um, an anvil. And then the newbie guy comes up and lays his arm down on the anvil and the old timer's just like, well, you should have known. And I know that that's frustrating, but sometimes you can turn those conversations into um, some great learning experiences because if they didn't care at all, they wouldn't have given you any feedback. Um, I know that we've all, even if you aren't somebody that makes necessarily um, these uh, devices for vintage machines, we've all had people kind of at work and in our personal lives that um, are not especially great at giving feedback. And it is nice when people do take time out to let you know sometimes you're just doing a bad job. But <laughs> I, I wanted to ask, um, as your projects have developed, the communities that have come up and rallied behind you, um, I wanted to ask what some of the kind of more positive interactions that you guys have had with fans of your projects, and if that kind of nourishes you as a creator and keeps you going. For me, it's, it's, you know, I've had features that are, you know, in beta or in a branch or something, and just the, the, the feedback from the community, the, the passion for it, um, you know, when they're excited for those new features to come, that, uh, that's been really positive for me. I think uh, some of our best experience has actually been able to talk to the designers of the original machines. Like, Joe DeCure has just been a tremendous cheerleader to us and a good friend and, and helping. And then, I don't remember his name, but we met the designer of the IWM to the swim chip for the Mac. Yeah, Ron Nicholson, yeah, Ron Nicholson right? So he, he's like, oh, we told him what we wanted to do, and so he just kind of gave us the roadmap of, of how to get there, and so that, that, that's been really fantastic, and yeah. Um, so something that happened was, um, to give some background, the Gravis Ultrasound was very popular in the demo scene. Um, it was used in a lot of demo scene productions. Um, a lot of demos only worked on a Gus. And there were a few really tricky kind of issues I had and a few kind of obscure demos. And this one Finnish guy, obviously, on the Discord I was on, it's like, oh, I know so-and-so who coded this demo, you know, 30 years ago. He might still have the source code. Let me see if he has it still. <laughs> and I literally got the source code for these old demos that never, ever been released so I could actually see. It's like, oh, yeah, you're actually kind of cheating here when you're reading this IRQ status register. Okay, I see what you're doing. So like, just little things, people reaching out and like offering not even just like code contributions, just like knowledge contributions like that. It's, it's invaluable. Yeah, uh, same for me, just kind of seeing how people, how people use it. There was uh, someone who stopped by last year at VCF uh, Midwest and he had this camera 
and it had a SCSI drive on the camera. And he's like, uh, could Blue SCSI work in that? And I was like, I don't know, but I, I'll sure help you try try to get it working. And uh, so went back and forth with him. Uh, I, we never really got it working, but actually he stopped me today and said, oh, I got it working and showed me. And so he has a this camera and it has a SCSI drive on the bottom and a DB25 port on the back and takes pictures. And it's just so awesome that he you know persevered and you know got through that and seen people make Blue SCSI work on new different machines that never heard of or thought of is just awesome to see. Yeah, similar story, you know, uh, I've sold some blue SCSIs to folks who are using them in jack hard looms to replace old hard drives to keep like literal million dollar industry machines running. It's crazy, <laughs> right? And they're like, thank you, you helped us keep this machine running. Or folks that are putting them in CNC machines to replace floppy drives because this old machine uses SCSI floppy drives. It's like, okay. And, and we help them keep their stuff running. And, and to see that it expands beyond just our hobby, that people are using these things we make to keep actual like business op uh, machines running is, is uh, kind of powerful. It's really interesting. You know, it is really good. It's, um, I, <clears throat> I, I get to sometimes be a fly on the wall for these conversations where uh, people come up and they, I, I listen to them talk to you guys and just say like, hey, I'm doing this weird thing with your product that maybe might be out of scope for uh, what people normally might use it for. What do you think about this? And I'm sure that those conversations are very, very productive in uh, kind of ex uh, expanding into new areas that you never thought were maybe possible. Or people that are just like, hey, have you tried this on a next queue? Or have you, um, uh, like, you know, hey, I, uh, what about um, these two things are very, very similar. What would it take to port this over to something else? So I'm sure that those conversations are uh, hopefully inspiring. Um, kind of a source of inspiration for me is when I come to events like this, I get to talk to people, I get to see what other people are doing, and be like, you know, that's such a great idea. I want to be part of that world. I want to be, it's, it's, it's sort of one of those aspirational things where I see the neat stuff that other people do and how it puts a smile on other people's face, and I want to be one of those people. And so as you guys walked around the convention floor today, I'm sure you saw other people's projects. Um, what were some of the things that you saw that you saw that other people were creating, maybe not necessarily people on this panel, that you might have been like, that's an interesting way of doing things, or that maybe is um, a neat idea that we could partner or bring a new idea back to the project that I work on? Uh, the who is it? The PCM CIA. Uh, oh yeah, Kevin. Kevin, yeah. He I talked to him for quite a a while about uh, like PCM CIA SCSI cards and just what he was doing and uh, maybe how we could collaborate a little bit on that. But then he listening to his whole story about how he's building these things and uh, trying to productionize, like actually getting them out the door and what was, the things he had to do was just really really interesting to see how he's uh, gone about doing that. So that's a really cool project. Um, I, I, I went and saw Ian today and was looking at the Pico guts because I actually hadn't seen it in person yet and you know he's he's taken the, the all the Pico parts and stuck them right on right on the card and and right now all our we're, we're just using the Pico clones and our the different Fuji nets that need it so um, we've been talking about how to make the manufacturing easier so we can make it more attractive for makers to come to come along so that that, that was a that was nice to see. And um, I guess he, so you mentioned like maybe a new platform. So the Phoenix 256, um, it, it turns out it has drive wire in there. And so I think actually just this afternoon, we took a, we took a, a Coco FujiNet and, and plugged it in and we're like that close to making it work. <laughs> That's great, yeah. Yeah, and something I saw out on the floor is it's not something that's even necessarily kind of in my area of uh, collecting or retro hobby. That it was uh, it was as, as simple and complex as, of an idea as just taking uh, multiple floppy drives for some of these other machines and putting that in a new um, enclosure, uh, so that way that it's like I've got something small I can place on my desk that maybe doesn't have that same footprint. So. Uh, especially for people that live in apartments or have a, uh, a roommate or a spouse that is like, you have 
a three foot by three foot space for your hobby. Yes. And if it goes outside of that space, it goes in the yard sale. So it's kind of nice to see people that are thinking also about um, sort of uh, making things smaller and more compact and maybe more convenient to use. And so that makes me think about things and uh, try to um, maybe take a bit of that inspiration back on my project. So I'm sure that everyone here had a, a little bit of time. I don't know, people were married to their, <laughs> to their stations quite a bit. So, but hopefully you did get it to get out and get, have a little bit of fun. But as, um, as we kind of go through this right here, um, I hope the audience is also thinking about questions and stuff for us, and we'll break here in about 10 minutes or so. So if anybody has questions, we'd certainly like to hear them. But um, kind of maybe a downer question might be, um, kind of in, in the post-COVID era, fingers crossed, um, what type of parts shortages have you guys faced? Um, or what happens when you make something on JLCPCB and you send it off for a manufacturer, it had 20,000 units in stock when you placed your order, and now there is zero. How do you deal with those type of situations? If at first you don't succeed, submit, submit again. <laughs> no, that did happen to me during the... Uh, 20, in 2020, the uh, chips for my keyboard encoders just uh, microchip to stop making them. I had to redesign my keyboard encoder around a completely different chip and rewrite the code to make it work. But that's just part of the whole game. It's like, and that, that's not just for us in the hobby, that's for anything, anywhere. You've got to adapt to those changes in order to just keep on keeping on, so. It's serial to USB converters, I think we had to adapt pretty early on. Um, one thing that kept us immune is we decided to, to, if we can get away with it and we haven't had to yet, is to not use any CPLDs or FPGAs just because the, for us it's really a, it's the philosophy that barrier to entry is so high and with like, and the Pico is just awesome because with all those PIO things, we, I, I think Ian and I, I talked to Ian Zeroff for about an hour at BCFEs talking about <laughs> PIO. But, but, um, yeah, so th th that we kind of dodged, dodged a bullet on, but it, yeah, it happens, right? Yeah, yeah um, I, I originally targeted the full Raspberry Pi, but when I was in the middle of doing it, that was totally in the depths of unavailability. And the main th reason why I started the project was to make things more available to people. And if people are gonna be going on and buying Raspberry Pis off of scalpers, off of eBay, that's totally going against everything and why I started the project. So that's why I moved to the Pico, because by some miracle or amazing supply chain management, like they had, they were completely available all over the place. So my goal from then on is like, I want to be as available as possible. I want to use as boring as parts as possible, mm -hmm. um, just so things are available. And there's a few parts here and there I have to, you know, scrounge for occasionally, but so far, like, by kind of pivoting very early on in the project. That's what really helped out. I think for Pi SCSI, the you know, pies were unobtainable for several years. And so uh, we went down the, the road of trying to port it to some of these Chinese clones, like the banana pie and the orange pie. And uh, yeah, it was interesting just how negative or how less optimal the user experience is with some of these devices, just as far as documentation's not there, and, and even down to the technical aspects, you know, just how the registers were laid out. Um, when, once we did get PySCSI running on a banana pie, the performance was just horrible, just the way, just happened to be how they laid out the registers um, for, that, for that board. So um, for us, that was a big challenge of trying to keep the project going when the, the necessary parts aren't there. Yeah. And uh, the Blue Scuzzy V1 was based off the STM32 blue pill, hence the name Blue Scuzzy. And that was uh, kind of before the Pico, it was kind of the dev board that many uh, projects gravitated towards. But it, by the time uh, Blue Scuzzy V1 came around, it was pretty, it was cloned really excessively. And uh, the qual build quality around uh, the blue pill dev board was kind of 
yeah, like this. You could buy a hundred from a seller one time, and then a hundred again, and fifty of them wouldn't work. So, you know, just try that, navigating that. And we'd had in the middle of the pandemic, some new clones would come out, and we'd have to actually change some code around for those. And it it was funny because the new clones were actually better and it would perform faster, but they would remark them as the old STM thirty twos. And I wish they wouldn't have done that. I would have paid a little more for the <laughs> APM thirty twos, but they remarked them. So that just caused a lot of people trouble because you know people go buy a couple of blue pills and try to make blue SCSI work and they couldn't so one cool thing that came out of it is I got really good at SMD soldering mm -hmm. um, you know <laughs> the transceivers would be out of stock at JLC so I'd order them without the transceivers then I'd get to solder a few hundred of them on myself at night nice. so that was a good thing I guess <laughs> since I heard a couple of people mention it um, has the Pi Pico really been transformative in whatever your space of the hobby is? It has been for me, is why. Yeah, yeah um, like I was the first person I knew about to really use the Pico in the way I did, but since then, like very quickly, um, like um, Freddie V, who designed the Pico Mem, kind of he saw me do stuff with the Pico for the Pico Gus, and he's like, you know what? This is like a project I wanted to do for. 20 years, and I finally see a way to do it, and it was with the Pico. So the Pico man, if people know about it, it's another kind of ISA card, but instead of really focusing on sound, it focuses on like memory and disk expansion. So you can just put an SD card in with disk images in, and it can emulate a, a floppy or a hard drive. Um, and likewise, Kevin Moonlight, um, who Eric was talking about, who he talked to, he's here at the show, um, is doing the same thing on a PCMCAA card, bringing things that these PCs, uh, laptops, had never been able to do, and the, the Pico made it possible. Like, I don't want to be a shill for Raspberry Pi. I know that they've got their problems sometimes, but like, it's it's been transformative. I think just having that kind of common platform that uh, you know the that everyone can build on top of and share knowledge across all these different projects is kind of the, one of the biggest things because you know. We're talking about uh, like CD audio, and you know lots of things about audio, so you can share those uh, things with us, and you can kind of go back and forth. So just that common platform has been huge for uh, vintage computers and uh, vintage clones and devices. I think the, the the PIO is just huge. Like when that when they announced that, and I was reading through the spec, I was just so excited, and my entire family and all my coworkers thought I was stupid. Like, but I was just so excited. I was like, this is this is game changing. You can you can do FPGA functionality in software. Like you can get that cycle accurate timing um, just with all these different protocols. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's fantastic what they did with that, and I hope it expands beyond just the the Pico world and and other manufacturers pick it up as well. And for, for FujiNet, our core device is the ESP32, but the Pico's opened up the whole parallel bus interface world to us, and or t super time critical, you know, uh, time you know code area. And um, yeah, we, we I'm loving to see like the A8 Pico cart, um, and then there's the Intellivision Pi, the the Pyro 2, and that's based on the A8 and those are the basis for, like, the, that's going to be the basis for our Intellivision FujiNet. And uh, we're just going to, you know, take that hardware and put FujiNet firmware on there. And so, yeah, so, so the, the Pico's been uh, uh, real important in that area. 50 cents in singles. Yeah, that's the other thing, the cost, oh. right? It's, it's just so affordable. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Well, as you guys have kind of talked about this and you talk about part shortages and things that have happened during the pandemic and all of that, if you could wave a magic wand, what is the one thing that you would solve uh, a technological hurdle uh, with your project? Or if you could wave a magic wand, what is one bit of technology that you would bring into existence that might solve a uh, technical challenge that you've been facing? Is more time an option? <laughs> yes, I'll get Doc Brown right on it. A AI that can write um, 6502, 6809, and Z80 assembly? <laughs> Correctly. 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 Yeah. For me, it's being as good as Graham Sanderson, who works for Raspberry Pi at optimization. 
Um, he's the one that ported Doom to the RP2040 um, because I want his skills to, to get OPL3 emulation working on the Pico Gus because that opens up so many sound cards that I really, really want to see. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I would just say time because there's so many good ideas and so many uh, good things out there and this not being, uh, you know, a full-time job or anything, it's just having the time to sit down and, uh, you know, get through these and push the, a lot of these features to the end and get them into users' hands. Hard agree. Without time, we can't get anything done. I have so many old cards for the Apple II I want to clone, and there's so little time to get them all done. See, I really appreciate that time is, is one of those common bonds with our group, and as uh, because that's my number one enemy on anything that I want to work on. I've got such a narrow uh, a period of time every day that I can dedicate to anything. And even during those times, you have family, you have work commitment, you have uh, life things that just kind of get in the way of doing that. So I definitely want to thank everybody for spending that, that finite amount of time that we all have here uh, in, kind of in service to the community and helping other people do things. So. Um, since we only have maybe a few minutes left, if you did have a question for the panel, if you would be so kind to go ahead and line up at the microphone. I've got one additional question for our, uh, for our panel, and then we'll go ahead and we'll take a few, and then we'll go through, we'll do another loop where everybody knows where to find our friends, and then we'll wrap it up. So the, um, maybe the question while we get a few people in line here is, do you have anything that you're working on right now that you feel comfortably or comfortable kind of teasing for the audience here? So for me, I've kind of gone further back in time. It's not necessarily something that will help the community, but I've really been diving into like the Heathkit um, terminals and computers from the late 70s, early 80s. And um, it's, it's been an exciting adventure for me just because it's, it's so much older. I've been, you know, doing late 80s Macintosh stuff for so long and just, um, it's, it, I've been really impressed with that community, how they've reproduced just about every card, uh, you know, and since the technology is uh, just that much more simple, you can recreate them. Uh, there's no proprietary Apple ASICs all over anything, so. Anybody have anything else they'd like to maybe tease? Um, at, here at the show, I bought my first Sharp X68000 computer. And that is something I really want to make a Pico card for. Oh, yeah. Really bad. So yes. I'm super excited about that. There's so much great music on that platform. So, yeah. So uh, I just finished and uh, uh, fully tested the, uh, uh, gosh, what is it called? I forgot what it's called, Ron. Oh, my gosh. Is it your Apple II emulator for the yes, Apple III? Yes, thank you. Oh, okay. So... Uh, <laughs> My brain just reset. It's been a long day, <laughs> folks. Um, so no, the uh, Diamond Trackstar Plus for the P IBM PC, that you put it in your P IBM and it turns it into an Apple II. I finally got that fully cloned and running. So it's just a factor now. Awesome. Yeah. But that's the easy part. Now I have to redesign it using all of those chips I was talking about you can't get anymore. So that's going to be the fun part. And the other thing that uh, uh, I worked on a little bit earlier in this year that I hope to get back to uh, later this year, I worked with um, uh, Fred Stark to reverse engineer um, some of the code for the uh, Spectrogen MSI, MSI Spectrogen, like the guys have over in the Weather Stars. Um, so that now uh, everybody out there that has one of those old Tidler machines, you can now push live weather data to it. We've gotten that reverse engineered. I want to get it even farther so where you can do full batch updates, put up updates and downloads to it. So we'll, hopefully this year I'll have a little bit more traction on that. That's very cool. That's very cool. I have such a list. I had to write it down because I have so many new things coming. And <laughs> these are all dependent on time as well as we've talked about. So. I kind of mentioned CD audio is looking like a real possibility with a little help, maybe. Wink, wink. And uh, got the. <laughs> we have uh, Blue Scuzzy Rain on the Pico 2 now that was just released, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago. So that's really awesome. Um, a Wi-Fi interface uh, to the Blue Scuzzy, so you'd be able to take your phone and 
you know, switch images or do things uh, from your phone. Because honestly, a lot of new users, uh, some, some of them are you know, kids who are in their teens and they don't have a computer um, to, to do things with. So they, you know, ha making the accessibility, not just for us in this room where we all have many computers and we can all do, you know, have an extra set of jumpers, uh, you know, shims to, to do things or whatever. We don't all have that, so users lowering that barrier to entry so anyone can use it. Um, working on a lot of Blue SCSI toolbox apps, so the, you know, allowing you to switch CDs, transfer files to and from your vintage computer, on many different platforms. I'm personally working on Next right now. And then the biggest one is that just during this talk, uh, Androda, the guy who does all of our hardware, just opened a pull request to make Blue SCSI 100% open source. So we previously were on a non-commercial license. Um, but now it is 100% open source uh, hardware, strongly reciprocal license. So go out and make million, thousands or millions of blue scuzzies and go sell them. That's really, really great. Thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a few minutes, let's take a few questions, and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Really quick, I just want to thank Eric Helgeson. Um, I'm a software programmer, not a hardware person. And, and he reached out and helped me when I was having a problem with one of his uh, repositories and, and the source code for it and spent half an hour, maybe an hour, saying, answering stupid questions. And I appreciate that level of effort everybody gives in the community. So just thank you. So this is for Ian. So why didn't you use an FPGA? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, seriously though, for everybody, um, one of the questions I was wondering about is going backwards. Have you, you've taken stuff from MAME primarily and some other things and brought it in. Have you ever thought about taking your stuff and emulating it on MAME or em emulating an FPGA, something so that you can test faster and that sort of thing? So we, we have a FujiNet PC, which is a FujiNet emulator that that runs in Java, right? No, it's, 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 oh no, yeah, that's right. It's it's C plus plus, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's in. That's right. Yeah, so it's 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 exact same firmware now, and um, and it gets all the updates, and uh, so it can run, and and the the community has helped adapt the emulator. So I'll, the Atari, the Altera. Mm -hmm. Emulator can talk FujiNet PC. One of the Apple II emulators can talk to FujiNet PC, and and yeah, and, and it's great for testing too, and playing and things like that. So, thanks. Thank you. So, like some of you alluded to earlier, I myself am not a professional hardware engineer. So, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how to navigate as not a professional hardware engineer, that transition between doing batch runs of onesies, twosies for myself to and now having to manage supply chain and cost engineering things for something that's produced in bulk. And then I guess dovetailing with that, but a slightly separate question, how do you navigate that in the situation where you genuinely do have that one specific thing that you can't do without? For example, if you've got a weird connector that isn't produced anymore, that you have to have that connector because that's what the device is. Yeah. So let's split it into two parts there. So if you want to comment to um, how do you kind of get started with the design and then the distribution chain and then, and then we'll maybe do the second part there for, yeah. for the unobtainium. Well, the, my solution was to uh, find and know Tony and then him to teach me and then uh, find and know Joe so he could help me distribute. So <laughs> I mean, but honestly, just finding people who have done it or, or, or who are doing it and picking their brains and learning from them. Um, there's lots of open source projects out there with you know, designs out there, so picking through them, building a few things. You know, I, I found it was amazing that you could just you know, upload a Gerber and get a PCB in a couple weeks. You know, that's something you can, I didn't even know was really possible until I kind of joined the vintage community. And now, yeah. And to be fair, I'm not a hardware engineer either. Well, you, you <laughs> do a lot more than me. Yeah, uh, for me it was it was YouTube. There's a lot of great resources on YouTube. Um, just people walking you through their designs and how they work. Um, and kind of, you know, as a software guy, I'm used to trying something, and if it doesn't work, I can try it again. 
Um, I think like the fast uh, offshore manufacturing has kind of enabled that. You know, I have a, a graveyard of PCBs that I designed and just screwed up something stupid. Um, so I think that um, is a lot more accessible to us to just try something and see if it works. Last thing I'd like to add is reach out to your communities and just ask questions because every single person out here knows something, knows an answer to your question. No matter what it is, whether it's supply chain or how do I run the business or can, I don't know how to do my taxes. Can you help me figure out the tax part of selling these things or whatever it is? Just throw those questions out there and you'll be surprised how, how much your community will stand up for you and, and help you do that. I, I probably have the least amount of experience um, on the design side of anybody sitting up here. Um, but as I often say, I'd be nowhere in this hobby or in life if it wasn't for other people that just took a, uh, an interest in whatever it was that I was curious about and was polite enough to answer questions and answer, answer dumb questions and answer that same dumb question five times so that no, I Ron, understood. You can't put that there. No, you can't put you're that right. there, Ron. Why not? It looks fine there to me. It looks pretty. No, you can't. Okay, that's fine. But no, it's, it, many of the people here on this stage have been very, very nice to me and have helped me um, excel in, in things that I want to do. And if it wasn't for um, a friend of ours who wasn't able to be here this weekend, um, Jason Merrill, um, who got bombed, is kind of his internet handle, um, helping me with projects and things like that, I, I'd be nowhere as well. But. Can, can we give a round of applause for Gut Bomb? He's flipping yeah. awesome. Yeah. Really talented guy. So what, what do you guys do about those unobtainium parts? We'll take one more question and then we'll go ahead and get out of here. Buy a boatload of them in bulk. And <laughs> so once you find a reel of them, just buy them all up and hope that that lasts you for a while. Yep. J JLC pre-order as much as you can because while, it's, while you, it's there, get it. If it's a connector, find yourself a Moswald uh, who can 3D print and combine pins and PCBs and 3D printed parts and it's a nice mechanical robust solution. Very cool. Yes, sir. Oh, hi guys. Sorry, sorry. Just uh, one question. Okay, love your. Pro I actually probably heard you. I think I've already heard like Pi SCSI love your projects. In fact, when I heard you talking about the SCSI and having to order more boards. I remember during COVID uh, that there people are starting to have a problem with uh, people who are doing projects just like you uh, and people are taking your projects and the work that you are doing is turning around and turning it and selling it for profit. And, yeah, see, and, and so I'm just really curious is like how much of a problem is that been? Because I know like for instance with GitHub, I mean anybody who puts any code on GitHub and puts it out there, you know, I mean, anybody who's taking code for free for profit, you guys, I mean, mm. monetarily speaking, it's wonderful, the work you've done, the projects and everything, but I, 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 dollar-wise, I mean, that, that's a lot of money that you guys are actually putting out there. So have you been having an issue with somebody taking your work and reselling it? I mean, it, PySCSI is an example. There, there is someone who, who sells it at highly marked up rates. Um, and, and for me, it's just a hobby. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate to be in a position where I don't need necessarily income from this hobby. Um, so f the way I view it is that the more people that get this into their hands, the, the more testing and more experience there is with it um, to just get the product out there and get people to use it. Um, I, I take joy in that. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that's one of the benefits of, of doing stuff as open source to that other people can do it. You know, if, if you know, I sell them at a lesser rate, so if somebody wants to get them from me, that's fine too, but uh, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, we, Blue Scuzzy did start out as a non-commercial, uh, so we chose a license that would disallow that, um, so that's, and we got some heat for not being open enough, um, but I think you can, you know, it's, it's our project so we can decide what we want to do. Um, but now I think, you know, Blue Scuzzy is been growing and uh, just growing and growing and so we decided you know let's just open it up for everyone because there's a lot of people who want to also take our hardware and do really interesting stuff with it so I think along the same lines is when you're a small project um, you, kind of, you do want to kind of keep things close because there are threats from commercial people that want to take your work and then just go sell it and make money and so that's one way we insulate ourselves for a few years and now as I announced we're going completely open source so we want 
we want people to, we want to get Blue Scuzzy in as many people's hands because I think, you know, they'll just help the project grow and will help even our commercial interests, you know, grow as well. So it's a gamble and uh, it, as open source is, it's you, you're an open source user, I'm an open source user, we have the same rights even though, you know, you know, I wrote the code or, you know, you design, or you contributed some code. So it's all kind of mixing, matching ideas and, you know, yeah. But there, there definitely are bad actors out there as well. You just got to... Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's go ahead and let's make one more pass. Um, if you would, just go ahead and say your name again and just let people know where they can find you online. All right. So I'm Jeff Pietmeyer and you can find us at fujinet.online. So I'm Tony Cooker. You can find PySCSI on PySCSI.com or on GitHub.com slash ACooker. Uh, I'm Ian Scott. You can find PicoGus at PicoG.us because PicoGus.com was taken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm Eric Helgeson, and uh, you can find me on uh, Discord on the Open Retro, Just Open Retro SCSI Discord, which uh, Tony is also on. we got 2,000 users there, so come join the chat and just BlueScSI.com and you can find how to get in, get in contact. Hey everybody, Joe Strohsnyder, Joe's Computer Museum. You can find me online at jcm-1.com. And I'm your host, Ron McAdams from Ron's Computer Videos. You can find me on this very stage in five minutes for Steve's panel. <laughs> everybody, thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>